Hey guys, Logan Manhart here, and I am joined once again with my good friend, Albert Turkington. And today we're going to talk a little bit about what we talked about last time, and I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into what Albert has to say and hopefully get a more of a striking conversation. I, was, I didn't want to interrupt him last time, so that was the big thing. But we're here now, so we've got plenty to cover. Oh, right. yes. Um... And no, feel free to ask away. I love answering questions that make me want to, that make me think. Mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, I, I'm sure most people who are going to watch this are pretty sick and tired of, you know, people asking some basic question. Right. And then some like nice rehearsed polished answer back and then just nothing progresses. The discussion never progresses beyond those few talking points. Like uh, I, I, I can't stand Q and A's where um, they asked the speaker, oh, what keeps you motivated? Or like, how do you handle opposition? And I'm like, look, just grow a spine and do your homework. <laughs> I, I don't know why you need to keep answer, right. asking these questions. No, that's true. So, um, yes, that's keep, true. just ask away. Sure. Um, so, yeah, uh, no, last week we mostly talked about the conservatism half of cosmopolitan conservatism. Right. Um, so I guess now we're going to mostly focus on the cosmopolitan half. Um, right. And your main and, thing and, now, I mean, you, you have this, you've created this genre of conservatism known as cosmopolitan conservatism. And I did my best to try to weasel out what exactly that meant from you, just because it's a new idea. And it, there's, it's more of a forward thinking form of conservatism, right? That's kind of the, yes. the, 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 out of the discussions we've had, that's what you've kind of told me. Whereas obviously so many people think of conservatives and they think of, we look backwards at history too much and we want to keep things more like they used to be. Right. And that's a big critique uh, of some people on the left towards us. Right. Not right. that I care about the left and what they have to say, cause I don't <laughs> agree with them. However, I would believe that's kind of what, what we're aiming at. So take it away. On that half. I, I, I like how you put that. And that's, that's very good. Um, but yeah, it's a, a strain of conservatism that is, much more friendly to words technological and scientific progress um, but done in a way but done through a conservative prism done through a right-wing prism where we do it right where we, we do it tactfully we make sure that the side effects are curtailed and that the benefits are maximized Right, because we don't want to get stuck in the past, and then we get too entrenched right. in tradition. And traditions, I like, I like tradition. We need more tradition, but we'll give it to them on this one. We're we're doing something different. So, right. I would say I would add to that that I think tradition, for tradition's sake, um, is not not always, but in large part um, redundant and sometimes counterproductive. Um, again, nothing wrong. Yeah, nothing wrong with tradition per se, especially when it comes to traditional values that have stood the test of time. I mean, there's a reason why they did. It's just that to venerate it as to venerate the past uh, as some sort of golden golden age that we must always try to go back to, for the sake of doing so, uh, I don't think is a productive way to go forward. I would agree. I think that's a good assessment, and that's where some people can get ideologically attached, right? Just like how oh, yes. the, the, the radical left has this view of utopia, the right kind of has their own view of utopia, Ooh, right? Yeah. But I mean, you can see where they cross, right? Utopia is impossible mm -hmm. to achieve, whether it's in the golden years of, of yonder or in this bright future ahead of us or whatever, you know? The, the, they they um, lose sight of basic pragmatism and they just end up not being able to go anywhere because of that so right that's what we're trying to change right and so so some examples of that i know we want to get into like the industrial Revo industrial revolution and oh, yes. the collapse of the pre-industrial order so that's something you wanted to talk about so try and start off what is the first off? What is the pre-industrial order? I think we all kind of get the industrial revolution, right? We think of the cotton gin. We think of all these right. machines that enhance the way humans work in the world. But what is the what, what's the pre-industrial order? Sure. Um, so this is where I definitely like to throw a bit of a, a bit of a bone to um, the, the the generally called the tradition the people on the traditionalist right. Um, so. 
they uh, I've known I know people I know people because just, just spending time in the America First movement, uh, you get into social circles where they genuinely believe that the industrial revolution and just literally the past three hundred years were, were just massive mistakes. These are people um, on the right that think that. Yes. Interesting. I know it's it's funny because people on the left, you, you have some of them that don't like the industrial revolution. Um, but they but they they see it from a, a more left wing perspective where oh um, it just gives too much money to, to the greedy capitalists but then the traditionalist right goes well um, a lot of the um, traditions and, and and social structures were uh, taken away uh, and and not for the better and the thing is I I wanted to say that I sympathize with them because. This is the thing about the pre-industrial order, which I'll, I'll explain in just a bit, and why I understand their nostalgia. It, it's because the pre-industrial order was quite stable. Um, and there are three main areas where they were pretty stable. Um, the first is demographics. Like when you look at the demography of the pre-industrial world, um, you have what's called a stage one demography. And basically what this means is you have a high birth rate, but you also have a high death rate and by and large they cancel each other out so over time you have a pretty stable population and any increases uh in population were linear as opposed to right now it's increasing exponentially right um but back then it was linear and you know every now and then even that linear increase was um curtailed by you know your occasional plague or war or both um i know in china uh every time a dynasty ends um, the, the ensuing period of anarchy usually results in a population reduction between a third and a half. Really? So like a black death every two to three hundred years. That's ridiculous. I did not know that. Yeah, it's hard to believe that as late as, say... No, this... Just because they literally wore each other out of existence, is that pretty much what it is? or? Pretty much. Wow. Yeah. That's nuts. Um, even, even when you had these self-sufficient uh, villages... And, um, in, in the countryside, just just warlords would just come sweeping across the continent, especially in the north where it's pretty flat. And um, yeah, you're, you're just you you just die. <laughs> that's just that's just. It's not it a laughing is. matter, but that is abhorrent. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. that's infor that's abhorrent. Yeah. Yep. And, and you know, um, pretty similar things. Yeah, pretty similar things also happened in Europe. And so based, but the thing is, from a demographic perspective, it was pretty stable because the population didn't just keep increasing um, over time. So, and then the second one would be um, social structure. Uh, in, in terms right. of social structure, you had the feudal system. Uh, those are pretty common in, in both sides of the Eurasian continent. Um, and the thing is that the feudal system gets a pretty bad rep, more so than what it deserves. And the feudal really? system was- Okay, no, I've never heard that said before. So. I I'm, I trust you, but the most the common person's probably gonna be like, "Whoa, there, buddy!" Right. <laughs> so so go ahead, yeah, go ahead and explain, yeah. Oh yeah, no, and in the history books, yes, it is. You know, it, it does lead one to believe that it was just this unredeemable, rapacious, exploitative, oppressive system um, set up by the nobility to just grind down the peasantry until the end of time. The thing now, I'm sure some nobles absolutely did that, and they, they, they got what they deserved. Some did pretty well, but the, the main principle behind the feudal system, the structure is that uh, the peasantry would stay on a certain plot of land, um, give a certain percentage of their produce to the local lord, and then in return, the lord provides protection um, through his own garrisons, through um, uh, an a garrison night as well apparently garrisoning just one night was super expensive well sure because i mean their armor and their horses and all i mean yes. that was would have been hundreds of thousands of dollars probably in today's money yep and but the thing was so the, the basic principle is this sense of reciprocal responsibility between the nobility and the peasantry mm, interesting. now we're now we're all human it wasn't perfect uh, and and yes some noble Quite a number of nobles tried to get away with as much as they, they could, but in principle, that was how it was supposed to be. And 
that's why it's not, it, it was still, I mean, it's still hard work. It was still, it still stinks compared to what, especially for our standards today, but it wasn't just this, this unredeemably bad system. Right. If you ever watch uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail when the king walks up and to like the peasants scrounging in the dirt, you know, that's the common look yeah. that people, you know, what people think of, of, of peasants and the feudal system. So the, the way he the way he made fun of the um, uh, lady in the lake story, how he reworded it over and over again uh, was actually pretty impressive, I must say. I'm not familiar with that, but that's okay. That's a, probably a whole okay. nother tangent. Yeah, we've got plenty to cover. Yes. Um, so the social structure, it was pretty stable. And then the economic structure, it was largely rural. I mean, usually 90 to 95% of the population was rural prior to the Industrial Revolution. Most of those people, peasants, engaged in what we would call subsistence agriculture. So basically agriculture to sustain yourself. No, not too many cash crops. So mm -hmm. not too much cocoa and coffee, mostly rice, wheat, barley, oats. Right. Um, and then the few people that lived in a few cities that existed largely engaged in very rigid trades. Like I said, starting from the year 1000 onward, you have the rise of the guilds. And so they would teach people certain trades to be a smith, to be a tailor, to be, I don't know what, I don't know what else. But yeah, things like that. I'm, I'm, I, I respect these people because I don't know how to do what they do. Um, right. And so, and the thing is, you could pass all these trades, even farming, were passed down to from father to son. And, and so, the the economic structure, the social structure, and the demographics um, basically work together to create this pretty bleak, relatively bleak but stable situation that could have just continued till the end of time. But the thing the, the ironic thing is the 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 social ethos, the the the, the hardcore conservatism, uh the hardcore traditional values, you know, um frugality, um, strong family values, social discipline in general, that were emphasized during this this period, uh laid the groundwork, laid the the foundational blocks of the industrial revolution and right. so I, I do want to make the case that the industrial revolution was inevitable right because because this goes back to cosmopolitan conservatism right yes. and how we're trying to let go of the rigidness of conservatism but keep the time-tested the, the the time-tested traditions that we do know work right exactly so your kind of ignoring the fact or maybe you're taking into account the, the fact that the demographics are no longer playing out the way they used to right yes um so the demographics I, the demographics uh are no longer stable and so right and so yeah, you're we're, we're trying to adjust to that through cosmopolitan and con, poli, co, yeah you know what i'm saying <laughs> second oh, yes, podcast absolutely. of the day cosmopolitan so, conservatism <laughs> All right. So all these um, stable structures in the pre-industrial order have all been um, tossed up. Right. And so right. And so I, I would like to make the argument that it is incumbent upon us to one realize that this toss up was in, was inevitable to accept it. And from there, after accepting it, work towards finding a solution and finding basically a new equilibrium, a new stable. Sure. Sure. So looking forward closer to today, since you've gone through the social structure, the econ economic structure, and the demographic structure, the period of the European Revolution you had mentioned yes. earlier, uh, at least in your notes here, that was between the times of 1000 and 1750 AD. This is when you saw the industrial order, f the pre-industrial order fade away and the industrial order come to existence. Exactly. Um, this is the period where very fundamental changes in the population um, of Europe and in, and in particular the North Sea area um, made possible the Industrial Revolution. Um, the, 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 the cultural prerequisites, the, the uh, demographic prerequisites, um, as well as some social structure prerequisites 
um, slowly fell into place roughly from starting from the year 1000 to uh, the year 1750. That was when these changes happened. So um, assuming 25 ish year generations, this happened over the course of like 27, 28 generations. Wow. Um, yep. And where do you get all this? Where do you get this knowledge base from? Just give give me some examples. So we at least we kind of know where you're coming from here. Knowledge base meaning, oh, like like this information. Yeah. Where do you get this information from? That's probably the right question. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I first stumbled upon uh, stumbled upon this um, on the website called the Alternative Hypothesis. It's run by a fellow named uh, Ryan Falk, and uh, F A U L K. I believe that's how it's spelled. Um, in in one of his uh, in one of his works, he talked he coined the term European Revolution, um, and he drew upon the research of a fellow named Henry Harpending that showed that. Um, contrary to popular belief, um, the last few thousand years uh, of human existence have not been characterized by evolutionary, or if you're a Christian, you want to be more comfortable, adaptational um, stagnation. A lot of people assume that over the last four or five thousand years, we've, we're, we've been roughly the same, like humans. We haven't fundamentally changed. And, and so this guy, Henry Harpening, that serves as the main uh, intellectual source for this, the, the argument of the European Revolution, um, proved that there were actually very dramatic uh -huh. um, change, innate and environmental changes um, that took place in Europe and especially the North Sea area that made the population more suitable for industrialization. That makes sense, because I think that's where we're headed here. The next question is, so, well the, well, the environment obviously changes. That's obvious. But what else changes in, what else has changed in people? What's changed? For, for one thing, um, people, uh, I, I was shocked when I first, when I first uh, read about this. During this 700, 700, 800 year period was characterized by um basically a mass pacification of the male population. And so what I mean by that is um, during this time period, roughly one and a half, one to one and a half percent of the male population were executed each generation. It's pretty substantial because, I mean, you, you got executed. One to far. one and a half of the male population was executed. Is that what you said? Yep, every so th generation. So three, are you saying three fourths? Oh no! Um, no, uh, or one, one to one and a half percent of the male. Oh, population. sorry, one percent. Okay, I was thinking yep. fractions or something. Okay, yeah, I heard percent. Okay. Oh. <laughs> um, but yes, they, um, and this is every generation. Wow. For for 27, 28 generations, um, because because you got executed for you know even petty theft. I, I still remember watching. Oh, you're saying when you're saying execution, you literally mean killed by another person on purpose. Oh no! As in, um, they were like hung. Wow! Guillotine wow! Because they, they were just they were just cutting people down left and right. I mean, wow! That's nuts. Yes, I was I was honestly shocked by how violent um, and how chaotic the Middle Ages actually were in Europe. I, I was honestly under this impression that the moment the Roman Empire collapsed, like during the especially late stage Rome, you know, you had this very decadent period. People were very live and let live, and people have very um, um, permissive attitudes towards a whole bunch of things. And then when, once Rome fell um, and the Dark Ages began, like all of that just sealed right, shut. Right. Everyone just instantly became prudes. But apparently um, this process was pretty gradual. And so even um, during the Middle Ages, um, Throughout Europe, you you had murder rates somewhere between fifteen to thirty per hundred thousand. Wow! Um, and what is that compared? On, what's that compared to today? Uh, this compares to um, some of the most dysfunctional countries in Latin America. Like we're talking like Nicaragua, Honduras level murder rates when you're getting to like thirty per hundred thousand. Um, and that was like, the day to day in Europe. Yes. In this time period, wow. It's, I was, yeah, I was, I know, I just, you know, you just can't, some people, I, I couldn't see it. Um, but the thing, but the thing is there, there are a lot of um, piece, this, so these numbers are based on the best that we can find. I mean, obviously it was the middle ages, so they did, they just did the best they could. Um, but yes, from, 
from about the year 1000 to 1750, you had the murder rate collapse from between 15 to 30 per 100,000, all the way down to below one by wow. like the, yeah, by, by the Victorian And this era. is the pacification part where yes. we stop killing each other finally. And we, we basically stop killing each other and, and in generally engaging in antisocial behavior because the people that did that survived were executed or <laughs> oh, oh, simply... oh okay now I'm, okay i'm thinking so the people who engaged in antisocial behavior who broke the law and who did dysfunctional things were killed whereas the people who were much softer survived okay pretty much and um one one interesting way of seeing this is when you look at the artwork um when when you think of medieval art i mean it's it's generally more cartoon like you know, more 2D, less, not so realistic. Right. And yeah, I, I also noticed when I, when I was just sampling medieval art, it was, you just had more scenes of violence, like more scenes of, you know, stabbing and gore and battle scenes. But then as you, as you progress over time into the Renaissance, the Baroque period, um, and even Rococo, you, you just had um, paintings become more and more realistic, more and more 3D, uh -huh. and also depicting less and less gory things. I mean, you, you have things like in France where they, they, you know, spent, the guy spent, what, two years painting the swing. It's kind of weird, but <laughs> right. you know, at least it wasn't war. And then in the Netherlands just had mostly like, like these slice of life paintings just showing like a woman in the house cooking food, like just, just these wholesome, non-gory things and so i would say that and this is this has been cited by many people as evidence that um europe was achieving higher and higher levels of civilization and culture over time and i would argue um the pacification of the male population had played a very significant role in bringing that about right because first off society changed which incentivized people to be nicer and more pass pacified but they also as a society began to idolize that so it kind of was i mean it's a positive feedback loop right yes um and that's a curious thing with um because every everything is every trait is determined partially by genes and environment the the real question is what the ratios are but the thing the curious thing is we don't know how exactly they play with, in with each other like which comes first yeah like a chicken or egg scenario. And unfortunately, apparently this is politically incorrect. So most people are either too chicken to look into this stuff or they can't get funding from people because those people are too chicken. Um, so we're still left with a few question marks, but there's definitely a back and forth between these where um, say the environment favors certain traits, um, certain innate traits, and then those innate traits become more prominent uh, over a few generations. And, the, and that, in turn, creates uh, an environment that further accentuates those, those traits. traits. And it's just like a snowball yeah. effect. Sure. Well, that would make sense. That's a good explanation of it. And that's a ne never-ending question, like you're saying. I mean, even my Thanks. my standard uh, psychology prof professors are like, yeah, we don't really know. <laughs> good luck. So, wow. Um, so now we're on, I mean, we're on to, are we on the third stage, the third stage yet? Or not, or not yet? Oh, um, there, there are a few other things. I oh, mean, good. that was yep. one of the big changes in the population. Uh, another one is what they call downward mobility of the upper classes. So uh, apparently, so during the pre-industrial order, child mortality rates were about 50%, like half of all kids did not see their 10th birthday. Um, but the thing is, that percentage was not evenly distributed between the different uh, social classes. So you have a situation where the upper class had far more surviving children than the lower classes. And the right. lower classes had so few surviving children that they did not replace themselves. So like if you had five, six, seven kids, like natural fertility, in, in many lower class households, you would end up with maybe one kid um, surviving. Really? Years. I, man, I didn't know that. I would have sworn it would have been higher. I mean, you always see the pictures of back in the 40s, these, these old people having 15 children, right? Oh, um, oh yes, that was that was normal. Uh, it was normal in, in the 1940s for most of them to survive. It's just that in the pre-industrial era, right. like just, just standards of health, like we we have no idea. Even in Africa, we have no idea how 
bad, how materially bad life was. Because even in the poorest countries in Africa, at least 60. Uh, back then, life expectancy, even in the richest countries in the world, England and the Netherlands, uh, was 35. Wow. Uh, it, it, yeah, wow. It, it's hard for us in the 21st century to, to, to wrap our heads around how bleak, materially bleak, really bleak, at least, life was. Um, so yeah, uh, that's, and so with the lower classes, you really had a situation where they were not able to sustain their numbers. And so what has happened, well, what happened was that a lot of um, people in the upper third were downwardly mobile and moved into um, the areas and the professions that the lower classes used to occupy. And so um, between uh, 1000 and 1750, um, they found that the top third replaced the bottom two thirds roughly twice over. And, wow. the, and the thing is, this was actually, I remember this briefly mentioned in my uh, basic economics textbook. Um, so and if anyone is in college that are, uh, that are viewing this, um, Gregory Mankiw, one of the more prominent textbook um, guys for, for econ, uh, look at the basic macro textbook um, and there should be an entry where it's where it talks about how the upper classes moved down and brought their values. Um, they're, they're basically their first world values. They're, you know, um, hard work, thrift, social discipline, self-sacrifice. Do not let your carnality get the better of you. And that slowly spread to larger and larger segments of the population. And at some point it hit critical mass. And that's when the industrial revolution took off. Wow. Now that is amazing. I had no idea that happened. So eventually you had everybody in society was, was living with these upper level values, these upper level norms and senses, sense of responsibility, essentially. Pretty much. Just yeah. because, man, that's fascinating. That's amazing. And then we kind of had that. They're like, all right, let's go. All right, let's go into the industrial, yes. into the industrial revolution. Pretty much. And then, well, and, and then the, this is the cruel irony here, because the, these very hard, um, I guess what you can call selection pressures, once the Industrial Revolution started, it started to greatly raise people's living standards. And so it enabled, and so what it basically did was, what, what, mater what material comfort basically does is it removes these selection pressures from the population, which is nice in the sense that, you know, people aren't dying like flies anymore. Um, the, the only issue is that our, the population started to reverse and started to backtrack. So we started to oh. no longer punish um, these more permissive behaviors. In the 1800s in the industrial, industrial revolution, that's when it started to happen, right? Starting and uh, definitely, it's definitely accelerated in the uh, 20th and 21st centuries. You see a lot of people just be, somehow being able to get by. You just you just see people um, getting getting by on welfare, and you and sometimes I just think you're lucky you're in the 21st century. If you were back 200 years ago, you would literally starve to death. So right. I hope you thank your lucky star. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Wow, that's fascinating. So eventually, well, we're seeing it now where the bottom third is definitely way overpopulating than the top third. And middle class probably, you know, depends. But what does that look like going into the future? Is it now does it go the other way? Will the bottom people eventually become the top or, or does society collapse? Sadly, it's more towards the latter. Okay. It, it, you, you will simply have a system where um, with, with time, there will be more and more people on the cart and fewer and fewer yep. people pulling it. Well, we're already seeing that in Western countries. Yep. Right. And, and the thing is, um, nothing personal against anyone. I'm not wishing anyone any ill. But, but the thing is, uh, no matter what your sentiments are, at some point, if we keep doing this, the cart's going to break. Right. And then that's it. Then we uh, start from scratch. Yep. Dang, that's I really don't want that to happen. I'm really hoping we can pull this together. So yeah, um, 
And, and the thing is, well, an, another um, way of seeing this is looking at breakthrough inventions per million of population. Um, what we so breakthrough inventions. Um, there's a surprising high. There's a surprising level of consensus on what constitutes uh, a breakthrough innovation. So, like for example, um, going from like the, the Samsung Galaxy S20 to S21, where you just add more, um, you know, gigahertz to the GPU, you add more me megapixels to the camera, or maybe add more cameras. That's not considered a breakthrough innovation. That's just an extrapolation. But like the smartphone. Oh sure, sure. The creation of the smartphone that is a breakthrough innovation. Right. And um, at, at least according to uh, Charles Murray's book um, on, um, uh, gosh, the, the, the title slips me now, but he basically recorded um, breakthrough innovations over time from like the Minoans all the way to the present day to see which part were most, respons most responsible for um, all our breakthrough how long, innovations. How long do you think that took to write? That sounds like it would have been an absolutely ridiculous task. <laughs> Probably a few years, so I, I hope he didn't pull his hair out. Well, I mean, he is bald now, but I hope I hope it wasn't because he Couldn't find out. an invention for lost hair. No, no, not yet. Um, but yes, he... Yeah, apparently, apparently his scientists and historians, because um, he, he basically asked a bunch of scientists and historians okay, what inventions uh, over the course of history would you consider significant, like game-changing? And um, he, there, there was uh, just independently asking a few dozen of them to give their picks. He found a very surprisingly high, surprisingly high level of consensus on what constitutes a breakthrough innovation. And so this is what it's, so this is what these numbers are based on. Um, what was found is that Breakthrough innovations per million of population increased all the way up to around the second half of the 19th century. So somewhere between 1850 and 1870, we peaked at about 16 uh, breakthrough inventions per million of population. And since then, we have slipped down. Um, we have fallen down all the way to about four per million. So it went from 16 million to four million. Yep. Okay, and so four, f the fourth and and yep and four per million was the same level that we had in roughly 15 to 1600 so yeah wow. the, the slide Ooh, back i don't is like a lot that quicker. i don't like that Ooh, that's kind of scary and what's even scarier is if this keeps going um by the end of the century we will hit less than one which was the same level was the same level as it was back in 1100 so like if this keeps dark up, ages by the end of, by the end of this century the european revolution would have been all for nothing wow that's i'm trying to think of what that would look like today where we would have where, where we would have a society that's only advancing as fast as it did during the peak of the dark ages or the depth of the dark ages whatever yeah the, <laughs> oh yeah i guess it depends on one's perspective yeah. <laughs> um yeah it, it will be as wow. chaotic as violent oh, uh, we'll just have a lot scary. more gaudy ugly steel and concrete boxes um to live in and more uh gadgets to amuse ourselves with that sounds so, very post-apocalyptic um unfortunately it really will be unless and i need to emphasize this proactive measures are taken by us as a society so is it merely uh, I, and i firmly believe that so is it merely the fact that we are not inventing as fast as as much as we used to is that really the a, a major problem here um that or is just one of the one of the factors that is and that's actually just the tip of the problem the the, the iceberg iceberg here because um if we just if that was just the the problem, then we just have technological stagnation at some point, which, I mean, it's not fun, but it's not the end of the world. Where things will still run, um, the economy will still grow for 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 a while longer. But on top of that, um, all the other traits that were um, nurtured during the European Revolution um, are also being undone. Uh, one of the references references. So um, the European Revolution encouraged what's called low time preferences, meaning 
your threshold for waiting, for, for wanting to defer consumption is quite low. So it means you're very patient. You're very um, forward looking. You don't care too much about present day Defer deferred gratification thrills. Yes, exactly. And uh, yeah, and especially in the pre-industrial order, you had to be able to defer gratification because during the winter, I mean, these families, especially uh, these, these farming families, they had to have the self-discipline to not eat their seed crop that was just staring them in the right in the face as they were hunkering down during winter. Um, even if they went hungry, they had to def they had to um, suck it up basically until spring where they could plant and grow and then harvest and not starve to death. And so basically the people who didn't do that, who caved in and ate their seed crop, they still survived into the spring, into the summer. They didn't plant anything. They didn't harvest. And then the next winter took them out. Why wouldn't they plant if they survived? Oh, no, as in because they ate all the seed crop. Oh, okay, right, right, yeah, of course. Yeah, because you need some left over to plant the next season. Exactly. Right, okay. And so unfortunately, we're doing pretty much the same thing where um, we're in doing, uh, where it's called, we're, in, we're engaging what's called capital consumption. So this is, <clears throat> excuse me. So this is a situation where you have persistently low savings rates to the point where it's negative. And so, you simply, or even, um, it doesn't even need to be negative. It needs to be low enough where you can't, where you don't have enough money set aside to make what's already been built, what's already been built. And so for example, in this country, you need probably upwards of one or $2 trillion a year just to maintain all the houses that we've built, all the, the commercial buildings, the bridges, the roads, the highways, everything. And so if we don't save at least that much, um, we will not, uh, we will be then engaging in what's called capital consumption, where we'll uh, let our infrastructure degrade, we'll coast, but at some point it will catch up on us and our, and it will bring down our li our ability to maintain our current living standards. So is the, just because the capital equipment um, goes away. So is the driver of all this just the fact that we improved our society? And, the, um, and we live more comfortably than we used to? In a way, yes, quite ironically, just because, how do I put this? Um, we, we basically became too comfortable for our own good. Right. Um, we, and there's nothing wrong with being comfortable per se. The problem is that we've gotten so comfortable that we've forgotten what is needed to keep everything running. Like there, there, there is a certain amount of effort, there's a certain amount of discipline that we need to exercise as a society in order to keep and ma to at least just maintain our way of life as it currently is constituted. And if we can't even do that minimum, um, then over time, it, our, our capacity to our productive capacity goes down. And so does our living, uh, our standard of living. That's just going to happen. I mean, we're seeing this happen now. It's already happening. Yeah. One thing that came through with the industrial revolution through with the industrial revolution was capitalism. After feudalism was capitalism, right? Is there anything else you wanted to say on the industrial revolution or um only only that at some point we will have to make some hard decisions as a society, as a population, on how we want to proceed going forward. Do we just allow this to continue to degenerate? Because it will. Um, or do we find enough people, um, driven people, to take action and go, no, we need to put a stop to this one way or another? It doesn't necessarily mean, you know, just take the, the, the reins of political power right. necessarily and, and, and do it that way through sheer force of political will. But some sort of force of will is needed to turn society around. Uh, I mean, Pat Buchanan in his book, Suicide of a Superpower, said that. Um, we don't, what we need is not another Reagan. This was in 2012, so before Trump. Sure. Um, we don't need another Reagan. We need another St. Paul. Uh, so we, we really might need that. A, a cultural icon that can flip the switch, not necessarily a political icon. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Interesting. That's interesting. So I guess one question to finish off this 
industrial revolution talk when if it continues to go down the road in a bad trajectory what is a, a general timeline are we going to see this play out in our lifetime and will it be game over when we're 80 yep you really so, so you think it'll be that bad um this is the thing this decade is um what's what some people have called the demographic cliff all across all across the so-called global north so north america western europe and to a lesser extent northeast asia but especially japan um all of these countries had a baby boomer generation shortly following the end of the second world war and in most countries uh, in many of these countries they are statistically the largest generation in those countries respective histories in absolute numbers and sometimes even as a percentage of the population um they next they this boomer generation globally um is going to go into mass retirement this decade so nice. in the case of the united states for example um the majority of boomers go into retirement next year that would make sense my dad's about to hit 65 <laughs> he's 63 so that is funny that is funny so and and the thing is once they retire the rate of capital consumption is probably going to greatly accelerate oh sure no longer uh and this is the thing i don't know i don't know how willing they're uh they are to admit this but they got all the really good jobs they did they when, certainly when did they, when they came into the labor force and because they were so big they held on to them by and large all the way oh. meantime have i think you're losing connection or my connection's getting a little scratchy Oops. here i think we're good <laughs> we'll see okay and, and the thing is, interconnection is unstable for some reason. Unstable for some reason. Should be good. Whatever. Um, but yes, once they go into mass retirement, um, you don't have in most countries um, a an echo boom. So millennials um, that have that have the numbers to basically sub them in. Um, we. The United States is um, kind of unique in that, numerically at least, our, our millennial generation is about as large. And that's only because of um, mass immigration over the last 20, 30 years. Um, but in literally every country in Europe, and of course there, there's Japan, um, they have almost no millennials. Wow. Because by the time the millennial generation was being born, their fertility rates had dropped to one and a half kids per woman or less. Wow, that's and brutal. So, like, and so two two point one is sustainable. Two point one is sustainable, right? Two point one is replacement. Yep. And so, yeah, we're we're pretty much alone, um, with some very small exceptions like New Zealand. <laughs> Big deal. <laughs> um, so yes, um, so this decade is going to be when that happens, um, and the thing is because we don't have another large generation coming in that's um, in that are in countries that have this same capital generating ability um, we, we we will reach peak capital next year and I and if something doesn't happen something drastic doesn't happen um, we will never return to that same level in our lifetimes like the in terms of overall production in terms of pr overall production in terms of overall production and also in terms of the overall ability no, no the overall compatibility of the different economies in the world so like it, when you have an a old a top heavy demographic you tend to export more just because you have more skilled workers because they've been in the labor force longer and then you export to younger countries and, and you hope they have enough purchasing power to to, to buy all the products uh, the problem is the whole Western world is going to go from export oriented uh, from an export oriented system to what's called a post growth system. So that means it's the end of growth. 
Wow. That will make, the, the Europe, will, Europe will basically become Japan. So the entire yeah. world will collectively tighten its belt all at once, and there will be yes. a massive vacuum and the lack of resources. Pretty much. That's terrifying. <laughs> That's awful. Oh, I'm so glad we have to live through this, Albert. Um, we're, we're 20 in our 20s right as this is all taking place. So we'll be on the front lines, luckily. Um, the, the, the one hope for us is that um, the people on our side, uh, the thing is conservatives actually have on average a little over two kids per woman. So I guess the one long-term hope that I'm looking for is basically people on our side having enough kids um now the other now liberals don't have kids like extreme liberals have on average 1.2 kids so it's wow that's than worse than japan. i was gonna say that's worse than japan i i've looked at them recently you're, you're, yeah you're talking approaching like south korea and taiwan levels of of bad wow so basically they're going to so basically they're going to they're going to they're making themselves go extinct we're not doing anything <laughs> there you and go so the hope is over time um at least in the middle of the country um you you will see a, another sort of fundamental change in the population where we'll, we'll get extra uh, um increasingly more conservative increasingly more religious because those are the people that actually have uh, another a next generation waiting and uh, hopefully that does some good things so fingers crossed that would be nice yeah we need some more red states and some more family-oriented people because we don't have enough of them so it's that's uncommon. good now i like to give out oh. i like to give a shout out to uh the great state of south dakota for being Ooh. the only non-mormon state uh to still have above replacement fertility there you go, South Dakota. You're doing something right. See, you don't go into give COVID lockdowns. You have a bunch of kids. It's way more fun. Way more fun. G give them a hand, ladies and gentlemen. Exactly. Give them a hand. You exactly. Great, I'm just, again, really jealous that she's your governor. Just wanted to make that. That's okay. She's I'm still ours. She's still ours. She's not going anywhere. So, <laughs> yeah. I, I have... Um, I don't even know how to describe Tony Evers, so we'll, we'll just, I'll, I'll try to forget that it's a thing. Understandable. Anyways. Yeah, so capitalism, Afrofeudalism is capitalism, right? And there's all sorts of tags people put on capitalism, right? Uh, and that's some of them, some of those you want to go into here. So post the feudal era, you start to exchange freely. Ab is that correct? Correct. Pretty much, yeah. So the power of um, the guilds um, kind of waned, and the power of what we know today as corporations um, started to increase. And so, uh, actually, let me back up. Yeah. Um, first, I like to establish like a working definition of what capital uh, of capitalism, and this is not to be pretentious, being you know kind of like a legalistic-minded person. Um, I, I don't like lawyers. Um, it's just that when when people use terms, they, they 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 wrap it in their own definition that best fits whatever they want to say or whatever point they want to make, and then they just go with it. And then the person they're arguing with has a completely different definition in their mind, and then it's just they they just keep arguing in circles. And I I just see this and I go, this is a waste of breath. And so, but yes, I always like to establish a working definition because you know some the liberals will say oh capitalism and then you know in their mind they'll picture some uh exploitative hellscape like haiti and be like that's mm. that's the, the end goal of capitalism like are you you, you are high i, so I don't even need to ask <laughs> yeah, probably but then, but then but then also on the other hand conservatives will then this um picture this super utopian paradise with unicorns farting rainbows because and, and everyone's just exchanging freely and shaking hands and singing kumbaya and um not necessarily because capitalism is is i would say is a value neutral term so what is capitalism it, when when you break it down it's you know capitalism so it's basically whereby you have a you have a 
stock of capital that's far and above level of subsistence. Basically, you know, in a subsistence economy, you have you know your your plows and your um, your, your your hoes and your axes. I'm I. I, I love my rural people because you guys vote very well. I, I don't know anything, so just hats off to you. But basically, those basic tools. So if you have a capital stock appreciably more than that, then you have very technically a capitalist system because it's a system with excess capital. And so from there, you get as many manifestations as the human imagination can come up with. On one extreme, you have the Soviet Union, which in this technical sense was a state capitalist system. I mean, you had dams built in the middle of Siberia. You, you had um, you had nice, pretty concrete logs in the middle of Siberia. That, and that's a capitalist system because they have excess capital to do that. Okay. And then on the other extreme, you have you know, so the railroad road sector was pretty much the best in a good way, in a good way, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> um, and then in between, you just have tons of examples. You have so the social market capitalist economy in Germany. They, they place lots of emphasis on, on the worker and you can see. And then you have these hybrid systems in, in East Asia where you have a private sector and then this parallel state sector like right. outright state-owned enterprises. And so there are just so many manifestations of capitalism. There is, it's a value neutral. So it's a value neutral. So what makes it good or bad is what we choose to do with it. So right, so it's garbage in, garbage out. Well, then it, it, we need to put in good inputs. And so that's not a political or like a policy issue. That's a, that's a political issue. We need to be less crappy as a society, and the less crappy as a society we are, the better capitalism works. Right there, what was the? There was a quote, I think it was by one of the founding fathers, that the Constitution only works with a morally upright society. Oh yes. Yes, and that's and ca capitalism as well. I think they said they had similar views about the free market too. So. Yep, you can you can still have a free market in a country of. Um, liars and cheaters and thieves function well because then you have to lawyer up for literal. Um, but if you had a society that is honest, upright, um, knows how to do the right thing, thing is trained from young to be to be proper and to do good. And you're kind of breaking up a little bit. You're a little bit dicey. Whoops. Is this better now? Well, I think it's mostly your video. I don't. I don't think it's your audio. Oh, gotcha. Um, yes, in both in both situations, you still have capitalism. It's just that one serves the people better than the other, and what determines that is the the society itself. In, in no law, uh, no no amount of regulations or no amount of deregulation can change that. That one is a fundamental thing that needs to be done. That's why. Not Ronald, not another Ronald. Sorry, Reagan, what what need what is a fundamental law again? I think you might have cracked up when you mentioned it. What's the fundamental law that cannot be? Uh, it's um, change, change, um, change, changing laws, like either adding or subtracting them, adding or subtracting regulations, um, isn't the 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 end all be all. It's not a panacea here. Um, the the, the the more long lasting solution is to have a better society. And then from there you get a better you get better inputs into the market system, mm, okay. and you get better outputs. Gotcha, that makes sense. So, the early I guess early stage capitalism that would have been in the Soviet Union examples you had brought up, um, or no? Well, even um, even before that, the, yeah, these are very historic examples where um, I guess we can start as early as the 1600s. Um, I, I I had to point pinpoint um, a date that where we're cap uh, the beginning of capitalism uh, i would point that to a uh, point around around the year 1600 um because that was when the we had the first stock exchange in the netherlands and the first publicly traded company ever the dutch east india company or or known as a voc in, sure. in dutch sure. um, too many flames makes me think of pirates of the caribbean 
Makes me think of Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. I played too many video games. No, I mean the British East India Company at one point controlled a fifth of the world. Like this was nice. yeah, this the, the these two like East India companies were like they're they're basically the poster children of early stage capitalism. And, and especially the the um Dutch East India Company, the numbers are just insane. And I've they're so insane I will never forget them. So basically a natural monopoly. They had natural monopoly. They had a legally granted monopoly on the spice trade in the East Indies, but even if they didn't have a legally granted monopoly by the Dutch government, um, they still would have had a natural monopoly because okay. there, there just was no more capital for to fund a competitor. And so what they so they, they were able to make what in economic jargon is called super normal profits. So any super normal of, profits. Super normal. Okay, interesting. So, um, normal profits, um, if you had to put a number on it, is around three to five percent net real returns per year. It's okay. basically just enough for people yeah. to still want to stay in business and not just go work for someone. Right. Um, so anything above that is called super normal profits, um, and over the long run you will just attract more competitors and they will compete those uh, super normal profits back down to that normal level basically uh, but and so in 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 early capitalism you had super normal profits because there just wasn't any time uh, for more competitors to come in and compete it down like low prices for consumers um lower profit margins and go that to that normal level and so what the Dutch east indian company was able to do um, is to give 18% dividends to their stockholders. Mm. Not for one year, not two, not for five straight years, but for 198 straight years, from 1601 to 1799. That's how much they were growing? Or? Um, no, that, that was just the spice trade. Wow. That's obnoxious. Wow. That's obnoxious. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It, it's only obnoxious if you're not one of the, the shareholders. Right. So, right. Sadly, I, I I would I would assume none of our ancestors um, were able to get in on that. Hence, yeah. We, we weren't born with silver spoons in our mouths. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. It's very true. Oh well. So and this is the thing. We'll, we'll never be able to get back to that. It, it, it just will never happen. Like, Not even if we make it to Mars and we open up a whole new sector of the economy? Well, even if Elon Musk, I'm assuming it's going to be him. Yeah. Um, even if he manages to do that, the thing is there is a lot of capital um, sloshing around the economy where it's a lot more easier for a competitor to come in and try to compete with him and therefore drive prices down for us, the consumers, compared to all the way back in 1600. It's a lot easier now. Okay. Even when it comes to like asteroid mine or some crazy far off thing like that. Um, but yeah, and the thing in early, so early stage capitalism it is we get all the complaints. And th mm. because this is where you are first, where an economy is first starting to accumulate capital. And so on a relative, basis you don't have a lot of capital but you have a lot of labor and so what this means is in terms of the, that relationship the bargain power is all in the hands of capital and i, I know this is and this sounds a little bit the, the thing is you can explain this in crudely marxist terms um it doesn't doesn't generate the guy so yeah oh i get it yeah um what, yeah oh i get it yeah um what would he um on april something uh he did Karl Marx did the most important thing in his life he expired he died that's exactly right <laughs> that's exactly right so have you have you gone into late stage capitalism yet or not or no i mean you kind of not yet so okay in early so early stage capitalism is where all the complaints are where you know you you have these like long 12 14 hour days in the factories um, not making too much money, barely an improvement to um, farming, to subsistence farming. But the thing is, this is only temporary um, because then 
over, because over time, as people are accumulating more and more capital, um, the what's called the capital to, the capital to labor ratio, capital it, it is in the economy per worker, and it and it does and it it does grow faster than population growth, and so that means over time. Um, regardless of how high or low fertility rates are, you, you get to a point, but not so much more labor. Okay. Slowly but surely. So just because you you're so you're break, you're breaking up for a second there. So now you've got you you now have a population finally in this late stage of cap, capitalism. You have actual large amounts of people living comfortably. And, and large amounts of people, large amounts of capital, so people are living more and more comfortably. And most importantly, there is so much capital in the system relative to workers, where the workers can start um, asking for more things. So like better wages, um, better benefits, um, better benefits. Um, and actually that's why, that's how, that's. That's kind of what started the uh, union movement in the first third of the, uh, the union. 20th century okay. in the U.S. Yeah. It, it, it's not that, you know, the, the history books will tell you it's just the workers rising up and, and then clawing back some of their, their rights or blah, or something. No, the thing is, the only reason these unions could demand the things they demanded was because there was these companies had the capacity to offer them these um these benefits and the, the, the levels of compensation without going broke. And the only way you do that is with, with more and more capital per worker. Um, but yes, so late stage capitalism, I mean, when people, when people say that, they think of some dystopian sci-fi society where everyone's grind under right. it. Right, the corporations boxes. heal, yeah. The, but the thing is, real late stage capitalism, proper late stage capitalism, is um, almost, almost like a worker's paradise in in, 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 in a sense. I mean, kind of where we're at right um, now, isn't it? I mean, you can make money, and obviously it's way worse off than it used to be, so I'm not making anything up here, but but you are living in relative comfort no matter where you're at. Yes, um, especially when you compare it to just a few generations ago. And, and the thing is, we kind of reach the peak of stage capitalism at least in this country somewhere during the 50s and 60s it's not that oh, there okay. is a peak and then you ah, that makes fall. sense the boomer generation wonderful yes that was the, the high water mark where you had the most capital per worker where i mean this was um not not only did the u.s pay the best products and cheapest products so like the best products and cheapest products so like even though this was the most capital intensive economy in the, on the planet um, our trade losses were huge to, to use. Yeah, it, it, it was, they were massive. But we, but we were able to do that because workers were so productive because of the capital we had. Um, unfortunately, the, the, well, see, the thing is, um, large corporations, probably not small businesses, but large corporations would prefer, especially when they're not loyal to any one country, they would prefer to turn back clock um, to the the so glory days of early capitalism, mm. they're glory days for them anyway. And so, when you see the push for um, free trade or um, mass importation of low skilled workers, what that basically is is temp of the ruling class uh, in this country to turn back clock. Ah, to those well, that's days. not how that works, though. That doesn't. That never works. Don't want to tell them that, though. Oop, you froze up on me, Albert. That's for sure. Okay, um, there you go. They're, they're definitely going to try to make it work for them. Right. You know, your your footage is getting pretty bad. Your your camera is getting pretty Oops. bad. I don't know if... I don't think it's on... that you press anything. I think it's just bad connection, but... I think so, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's been telling me that um, yeah. on and off. Yeah. Well, um, sure. Yes. When, when people talk about free trade, right? What basic what it means in effect is these companies go to third world countries where 
they have lots of labor but not a lot of capital and mm. where they get to just where they get to just their living standards but it's we sure. see it, it's it, you know it's really getting it's pretty bad losing a lot of, of the things you're saying just because of of the quality unfortunately but That's... yeah um we are coming up to an hour here though so oh, yes if you wanted to um, wrap it up yeah, here coming I'll, up to the I'll end i'll do my but, best to just wrap this yeah. up here um but yeah um this is actually the last point so yeah the, sure. the globalist corporations are trying when they when they do free trade um, it, it means they get to relive the glory days of early capitalism in these world countries and then send profit back. Here. And what that does is it also reduces the capital to labor ratio here and gives workers less bargaining power. And um, the same thing in effect happens when they bring in low skilled workers into the country. Um, it, they, they just create those third world industrial plantations um, right here in the U.S. And so the, the thing is, why I, I don't see I don't see why we should um, help help them along. I mean, I get why they're trying to do it. It's perfectly understandable, um, but it's not to anyone else's benefit. So I'm not sure why we should um, not put back. But but having said that, the, the thing is with the relationship of labor between labor and capital. Um, you, we need to not let the balance hit too uh, too extreme to, to one end, because the, the two, both of them are needed. You have labor, you have capital, and you have ideas. That's what goes into outputs. And so, labor and cap and so labor and capital need to both get a fair shake in order to make this uh, arrangement worth their while. So on one hand, yes, workers shouldn't uh, be exploited ideally. Um, they should feel that they are participating in the growth and they're sharing some of this growth. But at the same time, um, the holders of capital need to get at least a reasonable rate of return uh, for them to keep doing what they're doing instead of putting it under their mattress or in some CD or something. Right. right. So the, the, and this is the thing, yeah. The liberals and conservatives, like your, your typical liberals and conservatives, I'm one of the two extremes. And the thing is, no, you need, you need both in the relationship. And so you need to make both happy enough to keep it going. Right. And so that's the main point, like a balance needs to be strong. Sure. Well, that's good. That's good. We went we went through a whole lot of human history there, and unfortunately, some of it did get lost in the translation here. But uh, that's okay. There's plenty of opportunities to keep this conversation going. So, with that, I'll hit, I'll hit, end off the recording here. But thank you, Albert, for all the the insight. <laughs>